quella scena che mi si è molto bellissima. Quella mia scena mi ha quasi Ulevis wagar si quaruliso, shen shi zamtari ziga zapulia, shen shi zamtari ziga zapulia. Ulevis wagar si quaruliso, shen shi zamtari ziga zapulia, shen shi zamtari ziga zapulia. Ulevis wagar si quaruliso, shen Nini Palavandishvili, welcome to Reimagining Soviet Georgia. Thank you for coming on today. Um, how's it going? Yeah, hello. Thank you for inviting. Oh, good. <laughs> okay, so tell us who you are. What do you do? Well, I'm an uh, art historian and, um, uh, well, I study art history in uh, Tbilisi, Georgia at the Art Academy. And then uh, in uh, Berlin, I studied social and economic communication. So I have two degrees and then I uh, somehow tried to combine these two. So basically I'm a curator for contemporary art projects. Uh, with a focus on um, our urban space, living space, hence also my interest in architecture, and especially in the late uh, modernist architecture and uh, monumental part as a uh, monumental art as an inseparable part of uh, that period architecture. Great. And so one of the topics wanted to discuss today was I know that you are overseeing and organizing an exhibition in Tbilisi on um, Lado Meskishvili. So who is he and what did he do? Well, Lado Meskishvili is one of those uh, prominent architects whose work left uh, significant traces on Georgia and particularly on Tbilisi. So uh, quite many um, buildings which we still uh, have in Tbilisi um are created by him so we might not know or the majority of the population might of course not know the names behind the buildings and uh that's normal and okay but while uh or when we start uh, um, uh listing them uh then everybody is amazed like wow okay this one that one okay uh, of course i know that one oh this one as well so uh, like Tbilisi Sports Palace, uh, Chess Palace and Alpine Club, uh, Actors House, uh, uh, Telegraph Building, um, uh, former garage of the Ministry uh, of Council of Ministers, which is unfortunately demolished already. Um, uh, two residential houses, uh, the Agricultural uh, Institute, uh, uh, metro station, uh, former Lenin uh, Square metro station, which is now Freedom Square underground station, then uh, Memorial of Glory in Wacker Park. So these are just few uh, uh, objects that he has created. And this is uh, definitely part of our everyday life. We are passing these buildings uh, uh, on everyday basis. So we all know these buildings. And I guess, uh, you know, I'm not so architecturally inclined. So if you could just tell me, does uh, Meskish really have a specific style or is there something about his approach to architecture that stands out compared to say other architects uh, in his era? Well, he is definitely um, representative of late modernism period, what we call so in Georgia, because I mean, modernism as an architectural style, it started uh, in Europe and then later in the United States, like from the twenties, like of, of the previous century. But uh, historically in uh, Soviet Union uh, and in uh, Soviet Georgia as well. So there was this break between uh, 30s and uh, mid fifties, 
where the Stalinist architecture was uh, prevailing and dominating. So, and the Stalinist uh, socialist uh, in style and national in um, uh, character, uh, wait, um, socialist in, uh, 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 in style and nationalistic in the character. So this was this prevailing and uh, socialist classicism also, or Stalin em empire style, what we call. So there are several names, but what I wanted to say that uh, only after Stalin's death, when Khrushchev comes into power, there is this famous decree uh, where he prohibits any uh decoration on the buildings and this lays a foundation to absolutely new style uh in soviet architecture when Khrushchev was not that much interested in um, appearance of the buildings but i mean he was driven rather uh to built uh, fast and uh, cost effectively because there was shortage of living spaces. So with this um, decree, he wanted to push forward this rapid uh, growth in uh, uh, living areas and so on. But on the other hand, this definitely laid the foundation to this late modernism um, architectural uh, style, uh, very, mm, proud representative of which is Lado Alexi Meshishvili. So his architectural works, we can basically trace this whole uh, evolution of this period because he started working already in 40s. Uh, he studied in Georgia. This is also important. He, is, uh, he belongs to a generation who started, uh, who had his education in Georgia because before that, uh, still Georgian architects would be educated in um, uh, Russia or uh, also going to Germany or any other countries and after Sovietization and founding architectural faculty first at the Technical University and then at the Art Academy so this is when um, uh, Georgian architects get their education uh, locally and Lado Alexi Meskish really belongs to that generation uh, and then after Second World War he starts his uh, professional career and uh, his very early works still belong to this uh, Stalin period uh, and from this period we have um, Sanatoria Imereti in Tzalpubo still uh, remaining um this is the only piece which still stands and this is also very interesting uh, object we can uh, observe how i mean in its uh, appearance and scale so it's fully representing all the stylistical um uh, features what this period bears and right after that so this khrushchev decree comes out and he also, of course, has to adapt to the new regulations and to the new requirements. And for me, this is very interesting to, to observe how he changes from one style to another. Uh, while, for example, um, still continuing using arches or domed uh, construction, which is right after um, uh, Sanatoria Imereti comes to this sports palace. Uh, which we would not think that uh, was created uh, like two, three years later after this decree and right after Imereti. So because it is in its appearance, it's absolutely magnificent without any abundance, without any not necessary decoration, like very uh, simple, but very sophisticated building which is also important with its uh, structural engineering. So, because when we look at the architecture and especially of that period architecture where the uh, reinforced concrete comes to place, where new material, building materials come to play into place, where new um, findings, uh, there are many searches how to create this or that, uh, um, element and uh, Tbilisi chess pal uh, Tbilisi sports palace is definitely one of these magnificent pieces where a structural engineer David Kajaya together with the architects found this way how to put a huge dome with precasted uh, monolithic uh, plates built on each other like in rows uh, 
without any supporting material. So for that period, this is definitely uh, an achievement and innovation. Well, yeah, I was actually, <clears throat> I mean, I have a lot of questions, but one, one thing you brought up is this, um, uh, there's obviously with architecture, um, a stylistic design component. And then of course, mixed with um, the actual infrastructure of the buildings. And so I'm curious, um, you know, about the, sp the specifics of building new modern buildings in an old city like jo uh, Tbilisi, for example, that's undergoing kind of Soviet modernization process. And so how would an architect like um, Meskishvili or maybe his contemporaries in the Soviet period um, interact with building um, new buildings in, say, areas with old buildings? Or how did they interact with this kind of old geography of, of a city like Tbilisi? Um, uh, well, especially Lado Alexi Meshishvili uh, and his buildings, it's very interesting, uh, very good uh, question, because he always takes into consideration the exact location where the new building has to be put. Of course, it is not always his decision, because there is a um, huge um, uh, council of ministers behind, the government stands behind, this or that ministry, which is the commissioner stands behind. But uh, from the uh, archival documents, we still uh, um, can have looked into, they reveal that there are discussions, which place to, uh, where to place this sort of building. And of course they are, there are arguments, uh, pro and contra, but definitely what Lado Aleximes really does, he takes into consideration um, the given location and he tries to adjust and adopt to the given condition. So not to adjust the location to the building, but uh, respecting the nature, respecting the given conditions and adapting building to it. And for this, we have many examples, like also in Tbilisi, uh, the Chess Palace and Alpine Club, also the Actors House uh, and many, many more. And also in case of Sports Palace, uh, for example, there is this, um, the, uh, the building is uh, huge in its volume. It's huge, but you don't see it because it goes, the half of the building is underground. So it's basically like this, um, uh, like egg, uh, to imagine an egg, which is halfway underground. Uh, so these are also these interesting uh, findings, uh, what architects find in order to, um, give also account to the given environment, right? Yeah, and also we have to, uh, I mean, definitely mention that uh, Saburtalo and that location uh, where the sports palace stands uh, back then in the fifties, so when they started with the design and planning, it was still on the outskirts of Tbilisi. And with the telegraph also, we can, for example, say, because it still stands in the center of Tbilisi, it has to take into account neighboring building, which is also, of, of course, this Imeli, former um, uh, Institute of Marxism and, and the Leninism, uh, which is also a very important architectural piece in Tbilisi. So in this term, for example, he definitely uh, takes into consideration the height of the building, of the neighboring building, and the material, the cladding material. So the yellow tufa with which is clad the building, he uses the same material on the telegraph building. So just to uh, have this harmonic uh, continuation of the line, of the street line. I'm also curious, um this dynamic of the decision-making that was happening, um, both in terms of the architecture of the building, uh, in the vision of the architect, meaning how Meskishvili uh, imagined or believed that a certain building should look, whether it was in Tbilisi or in Skhaltubo, um, and then the um, decision-making, um, say, by the Council of Ministers or other bodies who have to kind of approve it. Um, how did that process go? I guess the 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 creativity of the architect versus the conditions in which the architect was actually 
um, um, able to sort of see their vision through? Like, what was that process like in in the in the I guess uh, post nineteen fifty five, especially Soviet Georgia. In many cases, it was quite a long process. So also this architecture, um, the archival documents and all these decrees for the building and this and that and agreements with uh, chief, uh, chief architect of the city or the governmental bodies. This is a very long process. And uh, uh, in the exhibition, we also tried to show this process uh, and show this creative process. I mean, not only bureaucratic and administrative process, but also creative process, because sometimes uh, the uh, initial uh, design differs from the executed design. So there was this initial design, the um, product of the creative process, and there would be discussions, they would agree or disagree on some features or like technical requirements, or sometimes they argue on building materials, sometimes they argue on height or volume of the building, and then there, there is this process of reworking sometimes three, four, five times. So um, definitely it was very, very long process. So I would say like, minimum three to seven years it would take to start with the construction and um, uh, finalizing the project. So it was not always, uh, even for such architects as Vlado Alexi Mestishvili, who was one of the star architects. So what we call now star architects. So for that Soviet period, he was definitely a star architect. So even he had to, uh, negotiate and um, uh, prove uh, his ideas and definitely he had to also defend his ideas. So, and uh, I guess from uh, all the archival material we have, he was sometimes like really defending his point. So trying his best uh, to um, argue and uh, yeah, have enough arguments why this or that decision uh, or, yeah, creative decision was made. Yeah, I was particularly interested in this question because I feel like, you know, um, especially in the in the post-Soviet era, you kind of see how there's a certain chaos uh, that goes into how buildings are built, where they're built, um, and for what purpose. And so I was just interested in, in thinking about this kind of more thoughtful, methodical, and kind of intentional engagement with the geography of the city that was going on, at least in this period when an architect sees what they're doing is, you know, not only something in service of the of the city and the urban dwellers, but also as like a kind of art, a, a piece of art and a creative process, you know, versus say um, maybe you know in the, in the in the period of, of of fast money and markets, you have people kind of throwing buildings for as much profit as possible. And so uh, I don't know that comparison to me was kind of interesting. Well, it is definitely very interesting, especially. Um, you also mentioned like this current uh, rapid growth or like deliberate sometimes like placement of a building because what I also see in Tbilisi that many buildings they don't for example take into account the uh, or the orientation to the uh, sun you know like okay sometimes they have uh, they, they don't have enough uh, um, window openings on the south or this or that and with uh, um, uh, Soviet period architecture and with Lado Alexi Meshishvili legacy, we definitely see how uh, delicately they choose how to orientate the building, right? So they exactly um, think where is north, where is south, where is a lot of sun, and how, how to place like uh, sunscreens or to have like dead wall and uh, this or that. So they they take into, uh, firstly, of course, they take into account uh, location of the building. Then they take into account the function of the building. And then they take into account, of course, the usage, the, like the future usage. So how um, the future tenants of the building, be it residential or administrative, they would feel themselves if, uh, in the building. So this is definitely what is uh, very evident in all these decision makings uh, uh, about the creative process or for this or that building. 
I'm more, I'm also interested in like, did he, I'm, I'm not sure actually if you mentioned this, but did he design anything or build anything outside of Soviet Georgia? He mainly built everything in Georgia, but he had several exhibition pavilions outside of Georgia. Uh, he had one pavilion built in Izmir, uh, Turkey for World Expo. Uh, he had a pavilion built in uh, Syria in Damascus. And we also know that he had worked on a reconstruction of the Soviet pavilion in Leipzig. Unfortunately for that Leipzig uh, project, we did not find any archival material, but there are a few archival images uh, we have which uh, show the object, but we don't have any plans, any uh, written material about it. So yeah, just to answer your question about outside of Georgia. Was that, uh sort of political decision to keep him mostly in Georgia or just by um, he chose himself? This, unfortunately, I cannot answer with 100% assurance. So um, I don't really know. So uh, mainly what I also know from my other projects experience that um, Georgian architects, uh, they worked in Georgia. There were very, very few architects who built outside of Georgia. Uh, so there were kind of collaborations within, uh, um, how you, you, you call them, like befriended countries or so like the other socialist or like the third world countries, also Guinea or so on. But Lado Alex Mesrish really did not work on that project, I guess. Um, well, I definitely don't know the reason for this. Yeah, because he also just seems he's designing and building everything in Georgia. I mean, he's a huge influence. He he was definitely a huge influence. And he was the leader of one of the architectural studios at Felicity Design uh, Institute, Pilkala Projekti, which is uh, City Architecture Design Institute. And there were several architectural studios and he was the leader of one of them. So he was very important architect uh, for that period. But nevertheless, we also have to give credit to other architects. I mean, he he is definitely author of the many magnificent works we have, but there are many other architects. So there is, of course, Avashvili, there is, of course, Kiknadze, there is uh, Chakhava, there is... Um, uh, yeah, many other architects we still have and have to give credit to. And uh, was um, Meskish really um, sort of like uh, got teaching these, uh, like a school of architects? Was he influencing a whole sort of wave that came after him and took his style and built upon it? Or did he sort of stand out alone? Or did he, so I guess I'm asking like, did he create a school of, was there a school of uh, Soviet Georgian architecture that followed in his footsteps? Well, he taught at uh, first at uh, Technical Institute, Felicity really Technical Institute, which is the Technical University now. And later on, he was a professor at the Felicity Art Academy. And until his death, he was teaching there. And what is also very important to mention uh, is that he, um, in his architectural studio, he was taking, uh, I guess, the brilliant students of his uh, taking over. Like after they graduated, they would uh, continue working at his architectural studio. So in different years, uh, many um, also import, I mean, less or more important, but very interesting architects continued working at his uh, studio. Uh, some of them, very, very few of them, um, uh, let me think, um, well, no, unfortunately, all of them have passed away already, but until very recent, like three of them passed this, uh, this or last year. So um, yeah, definitely he created kind of school of new generation of architects which followed his uh, um, style or um, yeah. Do you have a favorite building that he designed? And if so, why? 
Uh, I definitely have. Uh, actually, my encounter with Lado Alex Mesrich really started uh, in 2014, 15, like consciously, but unconsciously uh, consciously started even before. There is this, uh, there is the Tbilisi Chess Palace and Alpine Club in the very center of Tbilisi in Vera Park, which somehow always attracted my attention. And in 2014, 15, I started researching more about this building and uh, I, uh, I dig more deeper and deeper. And then at some point I realized I wanted to make a project about this uh, building. So this is when my real encounter starts with Lado Alexi Meshishvili. So back then it was just one uh, building, which uh, for me is um, really amazing in its design and how the design uh, features the function of the building. So first of all, it again, it stands in the very center of Tbilisi in not that big park, let's say. The volume of the building is huge, but you don't really feel it because it's distributed following the landscape of the park. So it, uh, the three floors, you don't really, um, uh, they don't really strike you. So uh, they are very harmoniously going uh, or merging with the landscape. Uh, the building is also, we definitely keep in mind that building was dedicated to a female chess player, Nona Kaprindashvili and female mountaineer, Alexandra Japaridze, who in uh, uh, Japaridze a little bit earlier and Nona Kaprindashvili in 60s, like became very important uh, for uh, Georgian, hence also Soviet sport. And there was this decision to uh, build a bigger sports uh, uh, facility for these two sports art. So he also has to follow the function. So because it was dedicated to chess playing. So there was, they decided to make this huge hall in the very center or the core of the building and the rest uh, facilities, they are arranged around the building. And uh, every detail in this building, the arrangement of the galleries around, uh, the decorative materials they use, uh, which is a lot of wood and stone carving, um, marketry for the uh, mobile panels, which separate galleries with the hall. So they all um, give indication or are inspired by chess and the Rocky Mountains, uh, what we call, because marketry, for example, this wood uh, cutting uh, um, artistic uh, technology is not very popular in Georgia and has never been very popular in Georgia. But for me, this is the parallel to the chessboard because chessboard is exactly like the small pieces. They are done by marketry technology. So he uses this material, uh, this technology in the design of the monumental building. Also the stone uh, vitrage, which is on the facade, this depicts uh, queen's crown, not the king's crown, but the queen's crown. So there are these very subtle indications to the function of the building. And then of course, like architecturally, this very um, light architecture, uh, huge ribbon windows, which follow on the full length of the building, which let in lots of light into the building. And uh, like all this feature, I mean, this, this makes this building stand out definitely. So uh, yeah, this is one of my favorite buildings. It was until now. But after studying all his um, uh, like his oeuvre and like his legacy, um, well, it's it's very hard now to say this or that one is my favorite. There are many favorites, and all of them they uh, I can tell you the details which fascinate me about this building or what makes them stand out. So. And what we definitely, uh, just to continue this, my um, thought is one of the um, aims or goals for me with this exhibition is, and with my research also in this exhibition is not only to show the brilliance of his legacy, 
but also for future generation, for current and future generation to um, uh, make them um, cherish this legacy, to make them aware of the importance of this legacy. So it's not the Soviet architecture which we have. So it was built, of course, in Soviet period, but then again, it goes hand in hand and parallel with the international um, uh, developments in architecture. So we definitely, I, I would definitely argue calling it Soviet uh, architecture. So this is international style and he can proudly be presented along the international architects of that period. And we definitely have to uh, be more cautious about the legacy which we have, not only Lado Alexei Meshishvili, I mean, with the uh, whole Soviet period legacy we have in the country and uh, start to um, appreciate it more and, uh, uh, well, think not only twice, but maybe three or four times before taking a decision uh, of demolishing this or that building. Uh, I was going to ask something similar in the respect that um, when I've talked to other people who had Soviet education, um, they you know lament the fact that the education now is much worse <laughs> and also just not as like rigorous. Um, I would say, is there anything we maybe you can offer about the level of training and education architects um, received, and if there's any differences into what's happening now? Uh, well, it's hard for me to speak about education or current education and curriculums because uh, I'm not teaching myself, so I'm not familiar about the exact uh, subjects they are teaching. But I would say uh, what I definitely know what was um, uh, part of the education in Soviet uh, uh, system that they would study a lot like uh, historically, you know, like chronologically, how architecture came to this or that point. Uh, and I hope very much that also currently the, uh, the historical uh, chronology of the education, uh, of our architectural ed education does not stop with um, 20s or 30s or Stalinist architecture uh, of the previous century, but it continues. And, um, and not only, I know several persons who teach that period at, for example, like private universities, also like uh, free university, but I'm not sure this is also the fact at the art academy or, so I, I, I don't really want to blame anybody or name anybody in particular, but I wish uh, it would be the case. So maybe it is also the case, but for me, uh, this is very important part of the education and not only of Soviet, but also of international, because what I just me me mentioned, right? Because they go hand in hand, they go in parallel and exactly to see this, that uh, buildings uh, and the legacy we have from Soviet period architecture is not less important than the international architecture of the same period. Um, so what is the process like we're, i know there's a difference i know in the us there's like architects and there's engineers you know there's a division that seems to be sort of contentious uh, part because engineers are are valued less than architects uh, in the sense of like who's the sort of the aesthetic part you know um was there a div i know because soviet union also try to constantly overcome the mental and labor division as an ideological component. Was there anything like that in architecture that we can sort of point to where they where there was a, a specifically a, an attempt to overcome such divisions? Um, well, yes. Also in uh, Soviet period architecture, we rarely see structural engineers mentioned. So all the books, like from that period, all the publications, Jay just named the architects. So they are the uh, front uh, face or the representatives of this or that building, which is of course not, um, I mean, 
I consider it's not proper, uh, properly and correct because, uh, as I mentioned, also with the sports palace, right, and also with other buildings, the role of the structural engineers is very, very uh, strong and immense in that uh, case. And also, uh, the uh, construction of a building is a collaborative process, right? So there are. Um, uh, architects involved, there are co-architects involved. It, it's also very often that the co-architects are not really uh, mentioned in the process. And there are many uh, people who, I mean, of course, one thing is the appearance of the building, which might be um, the authorship goes to the architect, but there are people who think about the further um, uh, elaboration, distribution, uh, execution of that idea, right? So, and these are the core architects, which are sometimes also not really uh, mentioned. And the structural engineers, and uh, there are urbanists, there are, um, uh, I don't know, there are technicians, there are, um, I don't know, I mean, like people who are responsible for acoustics or people who are responsible for, um, uh, I don't know, like many, many different other. And um, for uh, us, like current uh, researchers, I would say it's very important to uh, dig out the names of these people. And this is possible by researching in the first orders, in the commission orders, and original plans, because original drawings of the plans, they always have at least of the chief architect, of the co-author, and of the structural engineer written on the plans. Yeah. And what is also very interesting, I mean, this is not maybe like the exact uh, um, um, uh, like directly continuation of this, uh, but somehow the Soviet system, they never named the architects with the full name. So there was always this, like for the first name, they wrote initials, like the, the first letter and then the surname. And it is so difficult currently to find out the real names of these people, you know? I don't know why the system was, uh, what was the logic behind the system? But whenever I work on a publication in these days, I always try to name them with the full names for at least the future generation can know who were these architects. <laughs> you know, in a, in a sort of interesting thing, since I moved back to Georgia the past uh, eight years now, I used to live in the US, has been how, um, you know, the dialogue around new development and how sort of anti-human they are um, in this the way they engineer the way they um, structure it from you know the balconies to how much space to sunlight so on and so on and what's interesting is a lot of people like sort of movements like often led by also or included architects Georgian architects been saying that the Soviet Union had much better regulations and they were much more sort of pro-human as in like making sure they get enough sunlight and, and enough space um so how was that also yeah. maybe you can discuss that and how was that maybe reflected in in um in the arc in the architecture well it was definitely i mean we can definitely argue if the soviet system was good or bad uh, but the regulations back then regarding like the human conditions or taking into account like human living uh, space and environment it was much more regulated uh i mean the much hated also micro rayons for example right i mean look at uh Diromi, look at nutsubidze look at all these micro rayons we have the distance between the buildings the um the uh, uh, distribution of them uh geographical distribution uh the green areas which were planted it is much more human uh which we definitely don't have currently like exactly what you mentioned yeah like one building faces the next right and you can uh you can directly watch 
into your neighbor's apartment. So you have no sunlight, you have uh, no balconies, or if you have a balcony, you can't really use this balcony because you have uh, a, everybody looking into your balcony. There is no green space for kids to play. Uh, also from the Soviet period, like the all these green areas or the yards we have turned into these uh, concrete gardens full of garages and uh, uh, so on and so forth. And even currently, I mean, I also live in this huge Soviet uh, apartment block and in my, uh, my yard is full of garages, which the tenants don't use anymore. They are all too lazy to unlock and lock daily and several times per day to to put the car in to park the car in the garage so they park outside so this is again twice as much space as they are taking uh, over in the yard so uh, i mean we are really uh, living in a catastrophic conditions Mm, but there is no real discussion about it and people don't talk about it because nobody really because we have i don't know if uh, this communal thinking, thinking about your neighbor and next person uh, was uh, much better. Uh, was it enforced in Soviet period? Was it like um, must or people were much more um, collaborative? I don't know, but what, what I definite, definitely can observe currently that we have lost this sense. So everybody becomes so individualistic. Nobody thinks about the common space, the um, communal space, the, um, I don't know, to make our living environment, our yards uh, to be used by everybody or to be shared. Like sharing is absolutely, I think we have lost this word in our vocabulary. So um, yeah, in that terms, uh, it was much better regulated in the Soviet period. Honestly, when I first saw the elevators, when you have to put the money, I could not believe it. I was like, this cannot be real. Not. Yeah, people still cannot believe it. Yeah, but uh, this is, I mean, this is the sad reality because in my house, there is also this coin system because otherwise, uh, imagine 16 floors, uh, almost like uh, 30 to 40 apartments in one uh, this uh, entrance, like the block. And half of them, they would, if uh, like for the maintenance of this elevator, half of the dwellers would contribute. And then the system, uh, they came upon with this system. So if you um, voluntarily don't want to contribute to it, then we force you to do it so. I mean, which is not a nice way, but there is no other way. So, uh, um, yes. You know, it's interesting with Meskishvili. He, he, you know, he met, you know, Tzaltubo, he met at the, uh, what's it called, sanatoria, um, the Agrarian Institute, Metro Station, like the things he has built, like none of those things we really need anymore. Like the new architecture that comes in it's not a tribute to the people or to it's public transportation or something kind of public good, but the only things that seem to be being built are residential buildings and restaurants, right? Like the need for someone like Meskishvili is no longer here. Like he couldn't exist today because his works would not have a need for it, you know? Yeah. It's like very, very tragic. Mm. Yeah, very interesting observation. Yeah, right. I mean, we can also um, talk or yeah, have, I don't know, like speculate or um, uh, why was it so? So of course it was like during the Soviet times, those facilities were not existing, right? So all these public buildings or uh, the infrastructure, so they were contributing uh, to it. Whereas today we have this all and we don't even have the need in them, right? So the libraries, the huge libraries, the huge concert halls, we cannot maintain them. So this is also the sad reality that, uh, look at the concert hall in Tbilisi, the, the former Philharmonie. So the scale of the building, like we cannot maintain it on the daily basis. So that's why, and even though the building has a monument status, we, 
I mean, we, I say just we, but uh, so the state has, uh, or the current owners um, have turned the upper floor into a gym. Imagine, and the lower floor, the part of it is a uh, uh, real estate uh, agency. So, I mean, this is catastrophe what, what is happening. The Twilisi Chespel is an Alpine club. I mean, we have managed to give it a monument status three years ago and part of the building, this beautiful building is rented out to restaurants, to billiard club, to, I don't know, like small little entities, which of course, I mean, with all these separations and divisions, we lose the original idea of the building and original appearance of the building. But uh, we definitely have to uh, start thinking uh, much more intensively about the adaptation of the buildings, because there is also this one very important subject which come into play that there is no discussion about it in Georgia. I mean, in, uh, in Western countries, they already started about um, the um, uh, ecology uh, 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 issues, right? Because demolishing of these buildings, it's much more nature invasive than keeping them and uh, adapting them to new uh, uses. But we really don't want to talk about it. We really don't uh, don't want to know anything about it. We are much more uh, comfortable. I don't know why demolishing them and uh, bringing up new uh, fancy glass structures, which happened, for example, re really, really good example for it is the former uh, shopping mall. And uh, I mean, this complex of shopping mall and uh, um, uh, Freedom Square metro station, right? There was this amazing building, uh, which firstly, I don't know why we could not maintain the shopping mall. I mean, we, we need it, right? The shopping mall. Okay. There was no need. Somehow there was no need. For years, it was abandoned. There was, uh, there were several suggestions to the city hall that they would turn it into a contemporary art gallery or museum because we don't have such, we still don't have uh, such a uh, museum. And it was really suitable because it's in the uh, vicinity of the National Museum, National Gallery and all the galleries. So it could have created this kind of uh, museum's island, but we never um, thought about it. And then we demolished it and put up a new fancy shopping mall. So, yeah. So maybe we uh, we should definitely have this shift in our minds and start thinking in a different way. So start, uh, unfortunately, we did not learn much uh, from COVID and from all the nature catastrophes happening around us. So we are still stubbornly continuing uh, with our uh, neoliberal economy and uh, yeah yeah I think the the response of destroying everything um, that Georgia had and other places too but I think it was also extreme here without thinking about the future very short term uh, also sort of maybe you know vindictive in some ways trying to get rid as fast as possible but without offering anything really in in return has been really quite horrible for Georgia. And so many things now are abandoned still or completely repurposed as only for uh, paid spaces, you know, where you have to pay something to even be there, yeah. um, you know, hotel or uh, cafe or something. And it's like this sort of lacking of free spaces. Uh, absolutely, absolutely, yeah. I mean, it's, it's uh, yeah, even like very recent past. I mean, if we uh, look at uh, the architectural uh, remnants from Saakashvili period, again, I don't want to talk about good or bad or was it proper or uh, not proper, but the parliament in Kutaisi, these concert halls or like this um, uh, cultural halls on... Uh, uh, Enrique Park, uh, President's Palace. I mean, millions, billions we have spent, like taxpayers' money went into it. And uh, the new government comes and with this impulsive 
decision, like emotion, as I said, we, we don't want to have anything to do with these buildings. So we abandon them and we move into other buildings. And then again, we have to pay for maintenance of like double for two president's palaces, for two parliament's buildings, for, uh, I mean, this is insane. It, yeah. It's definitely insane. <laughs> <laughs> it would be good to actually respect the previous, the some levels, previous, past, and then move on and add on and not just completely reject every single time. We should start talking about it. I mean, this is what we don't do. We don't talk about these problems. I mean, we just prefer to erase them, just to cut off, erase, demolish, abandon, as if this problem goes away. So we don't really like to talk about things. And that's actually why one of the reasons we created this podcast was to force some, at least maybe not everyone's talking about it, but to have these different discussions in hopes that it would lead to bigger discussions about especially Soviet Georgian legacy and being able to take the good as well as the bad and not just reduce it down to only uh, repressions of 19, you know, 30s. That's it. And then nothing else came ever. So yeah, definitely, we've been attempting to do that. Yeah, I mean, that's absolutely, I mean, very good initiative. And uh, yeah, thank you also so much for inviting me and uh, all the other people and bringing up these topics, because this is basically why we all work in our own fields, right? I mean, me creating publications or exhibitions, you creating postcards and this giving platform for this dialogue is, uh, well, we have all the same uh, goal. So to contribute slightly, slightly, maybe to a better um, future and uh, living environment. What is the state of kind of like discussions about Soviet architecture in Georgia today? Because I don't think we really covered that. Like, um, uh, and why is it in the state that it's in? Because the reason I ask this is because I see a lot of people who are, you know, discuss things like, you know, the need to preserve uh, 19th century buildings, you know, in the old city, for example, restoration of these very, very old buildings. And around these initiatives, you get conversations kind of about, you know, old um, uh, buildings that need to be preserved or saved. But I very rarely hear anybody uh, having any conversation about Soviet era buildings, their significance, their meaning. And so kind of maybe to, to, to dovetail onto what you just said, what is the state of the conversation in, in Georgia today about Soviet era um, architecture? Well, I guess the reason for it is the uh, time period. So the gap between the Soviet period and we are living, it's still very short. So we really need to take distance uh, from this period. And this is um, unfortunately or unfortunately, I don't know, it's not only uh, post-Soviet countries uh, problem, the same problem exists in the uh, in Germany with the socialist legacy, the same uh, problem exists in many other countries with that period, let's say, for, with that period legacy. There are also uh, examples in Scandinavia and so forth where they want to uh, demolish this period architecture. So I guess the reason is um, the, uh, that we still need some distance to take from this period so that we start appreciating and uh, seeing it in a different angle because we still associate it with um, the uh, political system we don't wanna have to do anything with uh, anymore. Uh, but, uh, and luckily uh, I see that there is more and more interest. It's still very little in order to rescue everything but it's becoming more and more. Also in Georgia, for example, uh, um, there are many more tourists interested in this subject. There are many more younger generation locally uh, interested in this subject. For example, when I researched on uh, uh, Soviet period mosaics, I got several re requests over the years to support them in writing uh, their semester or um, graduation work, you know, like their, um, 
uh, or doctoral thesis or whatever. So, uh, and this the same happens also with the architecture. For example, Tbilisi uh, Architectural Biennial uh, also in very good way contributes to it. So they are involving lots of students who research on this period architecture. So there is definitely much more interest uh, and I hope uh, it will become even more and grow uh, rapidly so that we still can manage to uh, save uh, majority of the legacy we have.